Well, guys, I am extremely excited. You're right, I had less than 24 hours, but that is no accident. Let me tell you, God knew exactly who was going to be here, why they were going to be here, and the fact that I have this message ready for you guys is because the Lord has a word for you today. I'm super, super excited. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke 15. Today, we're going to be talking about running. And I'm not talking about physical running. If you heard my sermon a couple months ago, I really do hate running. I tried it again. It's just as bad. I don't like it. It's not fun. I don't understand it. But we're going to be talking about running because the truth is we are all running from something. We are all running. And see, you're either running from something or you're running to something. You're either running from your past or you're running to your future. You're either running from your insecurities, and so you're running to friendships that feel those insecurities. You're running from your loneliness, and so you're running to toxic relationships. You're either running for who you were once were or you're running to who you want to be. You're either running to the Lord or you're running the opposite direction. I want you to remember that what you run to is just as important as what you're running from. And, and I want us as the church to get to a place that we stop running from God and start running to him. If you don't listen to anything else I say today, listen to this one thing. What you truly desire, the joy, the life, the purpose that you truly desire in your life only comes from God alone. No matter what you run to, no matter how fast you run, no matter how deep you go, you will never be fulfilled if it's not God himself. See, I'm tired of everyone running to everything and everyone but God for the things that you can only find in God. See, some of you are here physically, but your hearts are far from the Lord. See, some of you have been running for such a long time that you don't even notice that you're running anymore. Some of you have been running for such a long time that you don't recognize where you're even at in this moment of your life. Some of you guys don't call it running. Because the truth is, it's easier to to put excuses than admit that you're running. Oh, but Juan, I'm just really young, and and I don't know if I'm ready to settle in my faith. That sounds like a lot of rules. I I just want to taste what the world has. I I want to go out there. It's easier to put that excuse than to admit that you're running. It's easier to say, well, Juan, you don't know what's happened to me. I really did try this church thing, and I got hurt, and so I don't think I really am built for this church environment. It's easier to say that than to say, I'm running. I'm running. It's easier to say, I'm figuring out who I am and what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, I'm really, I'm really just trying to figure this whole thing out of the God is really for me. It's easier to say that than to say, I'm running. But I want to encourage you, the Bible is full of runners, full of runners. Adam ran and hid from the Lord. Moses ran and hid after he killed the man. Samson ran from his calling. Jonah, a boy was a professional runner. Everything the Lord said, he ran the opposite direction. God still uses the runners, but it's time that we as a generation, we as a church, stop running to everything but the Lord. And so we're going to be in Luke chapter 15 Verses 1 and 2. And it says, tax collectors and other sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. Let's stop right there. I kind of want to break this down. Jesus is preaching. He's teaching some stuff. And, the, and, and he's teaching it to two different groups. The tax collectors, which, by the way, at this time were one of the most hated people around because they would always abuse and ask for more just to benefit themselves. And I don't know about you, but if I personally knew who was collecting my taxes every single paycheck, I would not be the biggest fan of them either, okay? And the second group is sinners. And when the Bible talks about sinners, in this specific context, he's talking about a specific class that is the lowest of the lowest. And I think it's very interesting that, that he says that the, as he's teaching, the Pharisees, which are the religious people of this time, come and complain and say, why are you talking to such people? Why are you eating with them? And then Jesus moves forward and tells us three different parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son. And so we're going to be in the third one. We're going to talk about the prodigal son. And if you've already checked out, because this is what church people do, we hear what it's about, and then we're like, oh, that's not for me. I know who exactly who I need to share this with, though. Open your minds, open your hearts, and let the Holy Spirit 
be the one to guide you and tell you what you need to listen to. I'll tell your neighbor real quick, I am the prodigal son. Tell your other neighbor, you are the prodigal son. As I was studying this, I, I kind of remembered back when I was younger, and I used to hear this word prodigal, and I really didn't know what it was because we've heard it so many times, and so I thought it was important. So the definition of the word prodigal is one who squanders or spends money freely, recklessly, and wastefully. And so in Luke uh, 15, verse 11, we jump into this story, and it says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before, your dad, before you die. So his father agreed to divide the wealth between the sons. Let's pause right there. There's a story that Jesus is sharing, and he's saying there's a father. He has two sons, and the younger son looks at the father and says, hey, I want what's mine right now. I'm tired of your rules. I'm tired of your expectations on me. I'm tired of always living to your, what you want. I, I want what's mine and I want to go. In other words, give me what is mine and die. That's harsh. But when you ask for someone's inheritance early, what do you ask? What are you wishing them? I wish you were already dead. And see, when I say we are all the prodigal son, what I mean by that is we have all left the path that the Lord has given us. And in Isaiah 53, 6, it says, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left the we have left God's path for our own. And in Proverbs 14, 12, it says, there is a way that seems right to man, but it, but it ends with death. Let me remind you that your path will lead you to death. Let me remind you that you are on a path of self-destruction if it's not the path that God has given you. And yet we choose to reject his plan, to reject his word, to reject his instructions. And we run to what we believe is better for our own life. We run to what's comfortable. We run to what's easy. We run, we run to what's instant gratification. We run to knowledge and understanding. We even run to the easy things because it brings us satisfaction even quicker. But let me remind you that the, that the easy way is usually the hard way in disguise. Something I find extremely interesting is that the father allowed him to go and waste his inheritance. We look at it, the second part of verse 12, it says, so his father agreed to divide the wealth and between his sons. See, God won't interfere with your free will. He won't. God didn't make you a robot. God gave you an action. He gave you a plan of salvation, and he hopes and desires that you choose it. It gives you that option. And it's because of real love and genuine love. God will allow you to go and be stupid. It's true. Look at your neighbor and tell them, don't be stupid. See, what we do as Christians is we get off of God's path for our life. And then we find ourselves miserable, hurting, spiritually starving. And then we have the guts to blame God for it. Oh, God, why is this happening in my life? Why am I feeling this way? Why have you let this come and happen in my life? Let me be honest. Stop blaming God for the path that you have decided to take. And Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, the Lord declares, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Yet we choose our own path most of the time. And I'm not reading this to, for you to say, well, if I have Jesus in my life, my life is going to be perfect all the time. My life is going to be beautiful, 75 and sunny at all times. It's not. Jeremiah 29, 11 was actually written to a group of people that were going to go through a lot of suffering. And yet Jesus, and yet the Lord says, I have plans for you to prosper you, not harm you, give you hope and a future. If we keep reading in verse 13 of Luke 15, it says, A few days later, the younger brother packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. There he wasted all his money in wild living. About this time, his money ran out and a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent, and the man sent him to, into the fields to feed the pigs. 
The young man became so hungry that even the paws that he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. Let's break it down real quick. When it says that he moved to a distant land and lived in wild living, in modern day language, he left the little city, little town that he lived in and went to the big city life. He bought the cars. He had the condo with the best views. He had the J's on with the Rolex. He had it all. He was probably the most known person in his town because he was probably spending money and buying everything for everyone else. But let me remind you that no physical object can substitute a spiritual need. It don't matter how much money you have, how many pairs of shoes you ever have, how much you go shopping when you're feeling low. Nothing that is an object will ever substitute a spiritual need because what you're desiring is finding God and God alone. And verse 14, it says, a famine swept over the land and he began to starve. I want to talk about sin for a little bit because sin may feel good for a season, but it will leave you starving and alone for a while. Sin will leave you and having a life of famine in your life. Sin will leave you wanting more and feeling worse. Sin will leave you, to, sin will push you to go further than you want to go. Sin will also cost you more and more than you ever wanted to pay. See, it is time that as Christians, we stop justifying the very sin that Christ died for. Oh, we as Christians do this all the time. One, it's really not that bad. One, it's, it's really not, it's just one more drink, one. It's, it's just, well, it's, I'm not having sex. Well, I, 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 stop justifying the very sin that your Savior died on a cross for. Sin leaves you empty and starving. I've never heard anyone say, man, I found hope in drinking more. I I've never heard anyone say, I found fulfillment in porn and in lust. I've never heard anyone say, I found peace and perfectionism, criticism, and controlling every aspect of my life. And it doesn't logically make sense. How can something that is bad bring anything good in your life? The world will never bring anything good in your life. In other words, sin will never bring life into your life. It robs you of your peace. It makes you doubt your purpose. It crushes your identity. The sin that comforts you one day will starve you the next day. A, a life and sin will make you a slave to it as well. And we see it in the prodigal son story. We see that he went from a son to a slave because he chose his own path. And in verse 15, it says, he persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed pigs. I want you to understand that this is the lowest job that you could possibly have in this cultural time. Pigs were looked as unclean, unholy. And the job that now he has, he also looks at, at what he's feeding the pigs. In verse 15, uh, 16, it says, so hungry that even the paws that he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. The gunk, the food, the leftovers that he was feeding the pigs started looking good to him. Why? Because sin will starve you to a point that even the bad things start looking good. See, what the Father gives, the world gives the complete opposite. See, God, God gives pure love while the world gives twisted love and hate. The Father gives joy while the world gives happiness that comes and goes depending on your emotions. The Father gives peace that surpasses all understanding while the world gives you understanding that crushes all, all peace. Don't give up a life in the Father's house full of love, purpose, and joy for a moment of self-satisfaction. And in verse 16, it always also says, no one gave him anything. Let me tell you that the world will never give you anything more than what it already has given you. The world won't even look at you. When you are at the bottom of its all, it will leave you there. It also reminds me, he probably had a lot of friends at one point. Those friends all left him, and no one gave him anything. See, a lot of people say, oh, well, Juan, I'm going to justify my running by the fact that, well, I'm trying to figure it out. And, and in between this season, God still loves me. He's, he still loves me, and I want to encourage you. Yeah, he does. But the question you should be asking is, do you still love God? And the deeper question is, do you love God more than you love yourself? See, because God loves you enough to let you hit rock bottom. 
Because the only way that you can look when you hit rock bottom is up. Anyone here grateful for those rock bottom moments in your life? Look, it is huge. Let me share a little bit of my testimony. I, I was a miracle child. Um, that just means that my parents couldn't have kids, and so they prayed and fasted for 40 days, and then they were pregnant with me. And so I grew up in this very household that was very Christian. I grew up in a very Pentecostal Hispanic church, okay, where we had church on Wednesday nights, Friday nights were revival, Saturday was revival, and then Sunday we had church from 2 to 9 p.m., and there was no breaks in between, okay? You think we preach for long. There was no breaks in, in between, and I was always in church. I was that youth that was ready to serve, ready to pray. But when I turned 11, I decided to go down my own path. I said, you know what? I don't want this church stuff anymore. I'm tired of it. I don't get it. I want to kind of do my own thing. And that led me at a very young age of 11 to start trying drugs and gang violence. And that constantly led me to choose worse paths and worse paths and worse and then when I was 15, I found myself in a courtroom being pressed some serious charges. And I remember I had broken my parents' heart. I had disappointed my family. And I was in my last hearing. And the judge looks at me and says, are you guilty? And I just fall to my knees. And I lose it in front of everyone. And, and I just cry out to the Lord and I say, God, if you can save me, I will live for you forever. That was the lowest time of my life. I, I made those decisions that led me there. And I was just crying out, God, if, you, if you're here, if you're listening, please save me. And the very moment that I looked up with tears in my eyes, the judge looked at me and said, you're forgiven, son. See, I ran so far from the Lord that my rock bottom was my testimony. And I am grateful for that rock bottom moment because just as the prodigal son, when you run and you come to your senses, you realize that what you had in the father's house is way better than anything that the world ever has to offer. Let me tell you that anyone can love you at your best. Anyone can love you when you look Instagram perfect. Anyone can love you when you look like that, when your life is perfect. But only the Father loves you and chooses you when you're at your worst. And if we keep reading, it says in verse 17, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the servants had food enough to spare. Here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against you in heaven. And I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. If, if I can be honest with you, some of you have to come to your senses. Some of you have been making it too, much, too comfortable in the, in the season of life that you're in. Some of you have made the pig pen a home. You have brought a pillow into your valley. And you've self-identified with the season of life that you're going into. That's not the plan of the Lord for your life. It's been way too much. And let me tell you why you're struggling to get off a of rock bottom. Because you're trying to do it in your own strength. There is not enough self-help books, podcasts, meditation, mental discipline that can help you get off of rock bottom. Only the Lord himself can pull you out of the rock bottom and give you a new name. It is time that you realize that getting out of rock bottom, you first have to repent and then rely on his strength and his strength alone. Why are you struggling? Because you don't understand that to repent also means to be still and acknowledge who God is. In verse 18, it says, I will go home to my father, and I, I will say, Father, I have sinned against both you and heaven. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. You know what he's doing here? He's practicing his repentance speech. Because apologizing takes practice. Some of you here today have so much unforgiveness because you don't understand that you have to practice apologizing. 
See, see he, he goes and he says, God, I mean, Father, I realize that I have fallen short. I realize I messed up. I realize what I have done. I am not even asking to come back as a, as a son. I'm asking to come back as a servant. And then verse 20, it says, so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long ways away, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. This is where the story gets really good. Because instead of the father looking at him and saying, why, why, and asking questions, it says that the father ran towards his son. See, I like to think that this wasn't the first time that the father was looking out in the distance for his son. If Jesus tells us that, that this, is, this is in the story, then Jesus tells us that, that if he was out there looking to the distance, he's also probably out there looking in the distance for his son. And I think it's so beautiful because, because instead of the, the son having to make his, all, his way all the way back home, the father met him as soon as he saw him. And let me tell you that it doesn't matter how far you have gone, how far you have ran, how long you've been running, the father waits for you to come home with arms wide open. If you look at the father's reaction, it wasn't full of hate. It wasn't angry. It wasn't mad at him. It wasn't disappointed. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't ready to condemn him. No, the father was full of love and compassion the moment that he saw him. And the father ran towards him. While, while everyone is running away from you, while you have no one else, the Lord still runs to you. While the world won't even look at you, he delights in seeing you come back home. It is a beautiful thing that we don't have to struggle because the moment that we repent, the moment that we acknowledge who Christ really is, grace runs to you. Grace and mercy runs to you and meets you right where you are. It's time that we start understanding that God himself is looking for you and knows exactly where you are. The story continues to tell us that the father was so excited that he, full of joy, he threw a huge party and he, he celebrated his son that once, what, once was dead and now he was found. The son that he, was, he had lost and now he's here. And as all this is happening, as the party is starting, the older son is in the field working. And when he finds out he, that there's a celebration happening for the younger son, the older son actually gets very angry. And gets really bothered by this. And so in verse 28, it says, The oldest son was angry and wouldn't go inside. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, All these years I have slayed for you. And never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And all that time you have never given me a young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet the, when the son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened cow. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be the older son. I'm sorry to all my older sons in the room, but don't be the older son. See, sometimes it's those that are in the father's house that are the furthest away from the father's heart. And we sound like this more than we'd like to admit it. God, when is it my turn? God, I've been praying for that miracle and you're gonna give it to them? God, I've been praying for a husband. I've been praying for a wife. You're going to give it to them? You know what they do. God, I've been asking you for, to do this miracle in my life. God, I've been asking you to remove this. God, I asked you for this. When is it my turn? I see Christians so many times be in the house of the Lord, but have their heart, in, heart to everyone that comes in it. How is it that we're jealous of the prodigal sons that come back, and God is moving re remarkable things in their life. God is doing exciting things in life, and you're asking, God, why aren't you doing that in my life? Let me tell you that complaining hardens your heart, and comparing takes away, the, takes away from what's already yours. See, we as Christians have to guard our hearts from complaining and comparing God has given you what you need in this season of life, and that is more than enough. See, a repentant servant is better than a bitter son. And I love the answer that, that the father gives to him. In verse 31, it says, his father said to him, look, dear son, 
You have always stayed by me. And everything I have is yours. Don't let the things that you don't have take away from the things that you do have. See, we as Christians, we have made for too long the house of the Lord about us and not him. We've made encounters in the presence of the Lord about our requests and our demands and not about who he is. We serve in the Father's house for what it can get us and not for who he is. But when you make the Father's house about you, you miss the fact that the Father's in the house. And verse 21, we're going to go back a little bit. It says, the, his son, this is talking about the younger one, said to him, Father, I have sinned against both you and heaven. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Grab a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. I want you to remember that the prodigal son wasn't asking to come back as a son. He just wanted to come back as a servant. But history tells us that in this time, the only people that wore sandals were family. And so when we see the father ask for the sandals and put him, put the sandals on his feet, it's not saying, hey, you're coming back as a servant. No, it's saying you're coming back as my son. You're not going to walk anymore with the authority. With, with, you're not going to walk with the label that you put on yourself. You're going to walk with a new identity. And see, I think that the Pharisees at this time, as Jesus is telling this story, they're waiting for the father to condemn the son. They're waiting for that moment of correction, that moment of, no, why are you here? And I think it's so beautiful that the son runs into his father's arm and the father never asked him to change. He worked in the lowest job possible. He probably smelled, he had nothing on his feet. And the father never asked him to change. He embraced him. Let me encourage you today that God receives you just as you are. But he also loves you enough to leave you that way. He will clothe you in a new, in a new coat. He will give you sandals. He'll even give you a ring because you are no longer a slave, but you are a son and a daughter of the Most High King. The father embraces you when you come home. And see, if we're being honest, this story of redemption, this beautiful story of grace and mercy doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because the son was the one that messed it up. He should have paid a price. And same for our story. It doesn't make sense that God's grace and mercy constantly is chasing after us. It doesn't make sense that we look at the cross and we choose everything else. It doesn't make sense that we justify the very thing that Christ died for. The only way that I can explain it is in this verse, in the, in the book of John. I think you've heard it before. It's John 3 and 16 and 17. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Look at verse 17. It's so beautiful. beautiful. For God did not die, did not send his Son, into this world to condemn the world but to save the world through him let me tell you that Jesus Christ is the best thing that could ever happen to you as the best person you could ever meet as the best grace love and joy that you will ever have in your life the thing that you so constantly desire is found in a person that gave his life for you I don't want you to go away saying well I'm neither let me tell you, you might have been at one point a prodigal son, and if you're not no more and you're living the right way, that should bring such joy in your life because now you have salvation in your life. Perhaps today you've been running, and you've been running really hard, and you actually have no idea why you're in church today. Perhaps this is your first time in a very long time coming back to church. Let me tell you, it's not an accident. God sees you exactly where he where you are. God loves you and his grace runs after you with arms wide open. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're ready to take that step of repenting and turning back to the Father, pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I recognize that I have fallen short of your glory. 
I recognize that my sins have separated our perfect relationship. And I need a savior. And today I receive Jesus Christ as the savior of my life. I recognize that he is your son. He came on earth to pay for a price that I couldn't pay. That he died on the cross for my sins, buried, and on the third day was resurrected. Father, today I give you my, tom my tomorrow and my forever. I give you my life. I give you my heart, my mind, and my soul. Father, I will follow your path for the rest of my life. Thank you for the sacrifice that you've given. In your holy name we pray. Amen.